Welcome to the Rule the Wasteland podcast. This is the Lord Humongous, a.k.a. Eric from RuleTheWasteland.com. I appreciate you guys tuning in. I had a question on, don't remember if it was on the website, RuleTheWasteland.com, or if it was on one of my videos, but someone had specifically asked if I would talk a little bit about financial preparedness, specifically in reference to dividend stocks, since I'd mentioned that before. So I will talk about dividend stocks, but first I'm going to talk about the entire idea of financial preparedness. And basically it boils down to this. Obviously you need to be financially prepared. In fact, I don't think there's any real reason to separate financial preparedness from general preparedness. It's all part of being prepared. The problem is a lot of people, when they say prepper or they say I'm into preparedness, they're into preparing for major but low probability events and they don't really do anything to prepare for low key common events or things that are actually likely to happen if they're not as serious as like a grid down or massive chaos type situation. So they actually aren't really into preparedness. They're into just fear-based what-if type situations. Because if they're really into preparedness, they take care of all the minor stuff that's actually likely to happen. And I had a video on uh, that I did showing a grid on the most likely to hit the fan situations to occur making a grid based on, you know, four quadrants based on likelihood of events and severity of events and saying that you really only need to prepare for the ones that are extremely common, even if they're not that serious or the ones that are extremely serious, even if they're not that common, because ones that, um, there's really aren't any events that are very serious and very common or else there wouldn't be very many humans left on the planet anyway. And even if, if an event is not very serious and not very common, then certainly it's not, uh, worthwhile to spend your assets preparing for it because it's not very serious and it doesn't really happen to begin with. And uh, yeah, so those are really the two main quadrants that you want to prepare for. And a lot of those will uh, are affected by your financial situation. In fact, our lives are affected by your financial situation. So there's no point in preparing for a life that may happen to you or a situation that may happen to you when you're neglecting to prepare for your life that is happening to you right now or things that you know are going to happen. You know you're going to have to pay bills for the rest of your life, whether that's just buying food and you live under a bridge. You know you're going to need some amount of money for the rest of your life. And since most of us aren't planning on living under a bridge as our retirement plan or the Smith & Wesson retirement plan, as Captain Capitalism calls it, you know, checking out when your resources run out, the, since most of us are not planning on that, we plan on having to spend money for rent, for food, for a car, for fuel, for clothing, and uh, internet, and electricity, and all that for the rest of our lives. So how on earth could you say you're into preparedness if you're not prepared to be able to do that? And like I've mentioned in many of my videos and many of my books before, preparedness is about being able to do without systems of support, freedom from these systems of support. So if you're planning on being free from systems of support, there is no more uh, a... Uh, dramatic system of support or important system of support in most of our lives at this given moment than our source of income. Everything we do, think about this, everything that you've done up in in your life for preparedness, for everything, has been based on you having some sort of income, some sort of monetary income. Obviously, you can adjust your life to change that if you want to, but it's still based on resources. Even if you want to go Amish lifestyle and not use... um, I mean, even they use currency, but I'm just using it as an example. Even if you want to go full-blown, uh, you know, cro magnet and not use any currency, you still will need resources. Your food, your wood that you're going to make, your shacker, your little teepee out of, animal hide, that's all physical resources. And money is just a medium by which we buy, sell, trade, and store these natural resources. So one thing you can do is square away a decent stockpile of these natural resources, which is what we normally talk about when we talk about preparedness. Keeping your gold and silver, keeping your food, keeping your water, all that stuff. Keeping the physical assets that you would use money to get and having a good stockpile of that squared away based on what your overarching uh, preparedness strategy or mindset is. For me, like I've mentioned before, it's six months. So I can have six months of physical assets squared away. Six months of fuel, you know, instead of paying for the energy, I'm going to store six months of energy. Instead of paying for food, I'm going to store six months of food. Instead of paying for the water, I'm going to store six months of water. But, you know, life goes on a lot longer than six months, hopefully. And if there's not a disaster, I still plan on having to uh, buy those things. I still plan on using those things. And I don't want to, I can't, I can't, even if I wanted to, I can't really store, you know, 50 years if I plan on living to like 80. I can't store 50 years of water or food. And even if I could, I would need the resources to be able to get that now. And I don't have that much. So even if you wanted to store it, you still need to, to gain resources. So 
It was a long-winded way of saying a lot of people avoid dealing with the fact that you need wealth to be able to be prepared for the future or even just to survive the future. You're going to need wealth. And people don't like thinking about being dependent on money because they don't think they can change that, so they focus on everything else. But the bottom line is someone with $100,000 you know, in cash in, in their safe or even in a bank account is going to be a lot more prepared than someone who just has six months of food and water because, like I said, the vast majority of things that are going to happen in our life are going to be better served by having a bunch of cash than by having a bunch of uh, camping gear and uh, food. And now, it's really easy to prepare yourself for a bunch of bad scenarios simply by having that food and that water, and that's why I recommend doing it because it's so easy to just reach a basic level of preparedness and protect yourselves from so many things that I think we need to do that. But long term, just for the rest of our lives, especially if nothing bad ever happens, you've got to square away your financial independence and your financial security, especially if you want freedom. Now, if you're perfectly fine with the job paradigm, you know, working for someone else and kind of, in my mind, being a slave to other people's decisions, but some people are okay with that. Some people don't mind having a job, their decisions on how they spend their day mostly being made by other people. Some people are okay with that. But you still are um, at risk of being uh, hurt by outside circumstances. Even if you're not fired, if the business goes under or something like that, then you have to go get a job for someone else. So obviously, I'm more of the camp of um, wanting to get this stuff squared away on your own. So that's what you need to do is you need to have source of income or wealth. It can be cash. It can be any source of wealth coming in, but it has to be ongoing or a, to such a large lump sum like a lottery winning or something that you could live off of for the rest of your life. But even then, you're going to want to turn that into some sort of income because even if you won $300 million in the lottery, it would be stupid to just buy it all in gold and silver and just sit it somewhere because... The, uh, that's only going to be the best situation in a very, very small number of uh, possible futures. For most of the possible outcomes for the future, even most of the bad ones, you'd be better served to have a solid amount of the physical assets and then investing your other wealth in a lot of different ways. And when it comes down to financial preparedness, that is the single number one idea that everyone needs to understand is that diversity is the most important thing that you can focus on. No matter what happens, if you have your wealth spread in a thousand different places and different you know, vehicles for getting income, storing wealth, growing your wealth, there's nothing that can happen that's going to make you go 100% broke. That's what being prepared is. is you, you have totally eliminated anything but the scenarios that are not going to matter anyway, like a nu- you know, full-on nuclear war. Then it won't matter if you had a zero dollars or a hundred billion dollars. You're just going to be in the same boat. But for all the other situations, diversification is most important. You're going to eliminate both sides of the bell curve in terms of outlier events. You're going to eliminate the one, like there, if you wanted to make the most money and you knew the future, that it would probably just be you pick whatever asset performs the best over that time period, and you put all your money in that because you know nothing's bad is going to happen. And that would maximize your profit. That would be like the right end of the bell curve, the total, you know, this awesome situation, the most money you could ever make with with um, a certain investment. And you would do that if you knew what it was. But we none of us know what that is. And if you put all your money in one asset class or one asset, then you're also opening yourself up for the things on the left side of the bell curve, which is the total disasters. Whereas if you knew the future and you said, what would be the worst possible investment I could put my money into? That's going to be one single area too. So if you're putting your money into a single area or a few single areas, you're opening yourself up for the the huge outlier events. So by focusing, by spreading your money out over a lot of different places, you're automatically eliminating the all your money being in the worst investments, but you're also eliminating all your money being in the bad investments. But I think most people understand how unrealistic it is to assume that you will get it right and putting all your eggs in one basket is much, much more likely to be damaging than it is to be helpful. And the degree to which it's helpful is never as good as the degree to which it's bad is hurtful. And I don't know if that's a little confusing, but let's assume that you got it right. And you say you have a million dollars, you put it all in one thing, and it's the best investment the world has ever seen, and you got it right. That's really awesome. But it's not, it would still be worse to lose all your money than it would be to have the best possible outcome for most people. You know, if you have, if you really think there's some way that you can constantly make a bunch of money again, like maybe you're a professional gambler, poker player, or something, and you just can always go make money when you need to, then you may want to take the risk. But for most people, Losing everything that you've built up over a long time and a lot of work would be a lot worse than um, the 
you know, that would be a lot more horrible for our lives than the joy we would get out of doubling that money most of the time. So you want to protect yourself from the, the really bad outlier events. And the only way you can make sure that all your money isn't in bad investments is to put some money in pretty much everything. And that would be including some things that you probably think aren't great investments simply because we're not always right about everything. I mean, I don't think I have to explain to you guys listening what we all would have said the uh, economy would look like you know, today in 2015 if you'd asked us five years ago. I don't think any of us would think that the... Um, the markets where it's at, the gold and silver are where they're at. You know, it's a lot of support. Oil, hell, oils, gas is 205 around here. So the bottom line is we can be right about a lot of things and still get the direction of all these assets wrong. So you really want to diversify because if we had, if we said, man, oil's never getting cheaper again, gold's never getting cheaper again, we would have lost a lot of money. And if we, we would have said the stock market's going to crash and we wouldn't, we've missed a huge upswing. So. You really need to consider diversification because if we had all our money and all those things, our amount of wealth would probably be about the same as it was, you know, a little bit from uh, from income that we'd created. So without rambling too much, that's diversification. And you want to spread out over as many asset classes as possible. When I talk about asset classes, there's um, this is what I'm talking about. You have, I'm not going to name them all because there's just, you could probably come up with almost infinite number of them. And the, there's increasingly novel types of investments and things like that coming out every day, you know, with, you know, peer to peer lending, cryptocurrencies, all sorts of stuff like that. You can you own domain names, you know, anything like that. And, uh, obviously you don't necessarily want to spread everything out evenly. You probably want to adjust it with your knowledge of how risky something is. But, uh, you, I mean, you have stocks, you have U S stocks, you've got international stocks, you've got real estate, you've got bonds, You've got physical businesses and stuff like that. You know, you, there's all sorts of things you can uh, invest in. And uh, obviously, you can go down even more minutiae like that. Small cap stocks, large cap stocks, emerging markets, all that stuff too. But the, the bottom line is the more things you have your money spread out in, the less likely you are to ever have a catastrophic loss. And uh, so that's what you want to focus on is do research, find a bunch of different areas. And even if you're going to be a, in mostly stocks, something like the... Um, Everyone would ask me if if everyone excuse me if anyone ever asks me what they should invest in. And first of all, I need to say that none of this is, should be considered investment advice. This is just my ideas about investing. So if you want investment advice, go to talk to someone who's officially and legally qualified to do so. This is just my uh, ideas on the subject. But if anyone is ever talking to me about investing and wants to know what I think would be a good idea once you have your physical assets squared away, you know, a good base for your three or six months or whatever you think is reasonable. And that includes three or six months of living expenses and, and physical assets. I always say the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund because you have super low um, fees, like less than 1%, and you're buying every stock in the stock market. So there's no more diversified you can get, at least when it comes to the stock market. So anything you put in stocks... You could put in there. And a lot of people say, oh, well, this stock can go up more. This stock can go up. But that's what I'm talking about on the diversification versus trying to pick winners. When you're trying to pick a winner, when you get it right, yeah, you will beat the um, the market. But when you get it wrong, you can lose everything. So it's up to you. Do you think you're the type of person that can beat the big banks with their high frequency trading and, have, you know, hundreds or thousands of people that are spending full time jobs trying to uh, to beat you? Or do you just want to get the entire market as a whole and uh know that you're you're not going to let lose money unless everyone else is losing money at the same time so that's what i recommend is and then you can get they have international funds as well that do the same thing so you could do the entire u.s stock market big chunks of the international stock market you can get some real estate physically real estate or you can get some reits you can get some bonds and while i think bonds are probably not going to do very well the um like i said are you in the business of picking winners or are you in the business of getting a little piece of everything so you can't lose that's what I think is a better idea. And then you can always have a little bit that you shift percentages and allocations based on what you see in the future. But I would never totally invest in one thing and probably very rarely sell out of one asset class completely either. So now with that, that's diversification. That is your asset class. You need to spread your money around. Physical assets, all sorts of different monetary vehicles, and uh, everything you can think of. Spread your money around. Next up, we'll be focusing on income versus simple appreciation. And this is why um, a lot of the problem with the market today is it's very abstract. It's no longer technically based on whether a company is 
doing well even or even making money. Like a stock has become totally divorced from the actual fundamentals most of the time. And that's how we can be so wrong about where the market is today if you'd asked us, you know, five or ten years ago, is because the economy is shit. And the market's doing, you know, it's going high because, first of all, there's a lot of manipulation, but they're able to manipulate it because it's so divorced from the fundamentals. You can have a stock market that's really high when the companies are doing poorly, and you can have a stock plummet when the company is making more money than ever because it just all depends. It's all buying and selling, or it's all based on uh, buying and selling and not necessarily based on fundamentals. I mean, to some extent, if a company is doing terribly, it's probably not going to have a good stock. But it's not necessarily connected in that way like it should be. Like if you if it made a lot of sense, it should be connected like that. And also, the difference that that makes is that most stocks today, I don't know about most maybe, but a lot of stocks, and certainly when most people buy a stock, they think of buying a stock and then selling it later when it's worth more money. But when you think about it, what is a stock? A stock is you're buying part ownership of a business. So if you went and bought the local McDonald's and you said this guy is selling part of it, hey, I'm selling 10% of my McDonald's business for, you know, 20 grand or whatever. And you said, okay, here's 20 grand. And then you go home and you say, man, I hope someone buys this from me later for more money. No, you would go back every week and be like, hey, where's my 20% of the business? How much did we make this week? Cool, I get 20%, right? So the idea that people would not do that with their stocks is kind of baffling to me. I really don't think it's a good idea to buy a stock that you're not getting a dividend from because you're literally buying ownership in a business. To buy ownership in a business simply because you think someone else might pay for you later and not demand a portion of their revenue is crazy to me. So obviously when you're buying like the total stock market index, you're getting all of businesses, but uh, you are getting dividends from that as well. I think it's like 1.9 or 2% dividend or something like that. And you also get appreciation. So when you buy a dividend stock, they can sure appreciate too. But the good part is that you make money no matter what, because there's been plenty of situations throughout history, at least United States history, obviously stock market history, where there's been significant decreases in the overall market or even a particular stock, but the dividends have stayed the same. So if you get a 5% or I mean a 5 cent dividend a share or whatever, and uh, the price of the, the share plummets, you're still getting your dividend unless they adjust it. And these big companies, because the market isn't really connected to how they're doing. Like when there's a stock market crash of 08 or whatever, Walmart was still selling stuff. BP was still selling, you know, gas. Uh, Philip Morris was still selling a bunch of cigarettes. So you're still getting your percentage of that overall. And if the stock market crash is due to a actual economic turmoil, then people may be buying less cigarettes and they may be buying less stuff from Walmart and they may, may be buying less oil. So they may drop their dividends. But most of these huge companies have maintained dividend raises for decades. And that's what you want to look at if you're focusing on specific stocks is ones that can give you consistent performance. That way you don't have to worry about the number, the market as a number. You're worried about, is this company making money? I've got a piece of it. I'm getting a piece of that money. It doesn't really matter what the stock price is at. Like if your McDonald's was making $100,000 a month and you get 20% of that and all of a sudden McDonald's stock goes to a dollar, that doesn't mean that the McDonald's isn't going to make $100,000 next month. You know, in fact, it may even make more. So you're like, whatever, what do you care? You're still, you're not selling it. You're getting the money from the, the income. And so that's very important when focusing on uh, stocks specifically, I think, is to, to if you're going to buy ownership in a business, make sure you get your cut. So I'm huge on dividend stocks. I'm not going to um, specifically, um, what do you say, recommend any individual stocks because I'm not an expert in that particular area of evaluating which stocks are good. But there are a lot of great websites out there that do do that. And one of the ones that I can recommend that I followed for a while is Dividend Mantra. I think it's just DividendMantra.com. And his is really good. He's got a really – and I'm, don't expect these people to be preppers because they're not. And a lot of them are down on gold and stuff like that because they are huge on income. They're big on creating income. But we need to hear diverse – opinions and diverse voice voices and he's obviously much more of an expert on that than i am so i would definitely go check out his website if you're interested in a dividend portfolio and he's trying to reach financial independence and uh, dividend stocks are a great way to do that now that's my mission overall is to use all these different vehicles like i'd mentioned before all this diversification to free myself from the job paradigm and also to free myself from systems of support so my uh, plan is to originally free myself from the job paradigm, which I've done for the most part right now. 
I don't have a specific nine to five job right now as of this moment right now. But then I'm also working on developing multiple sources of income because even if you don't have a specific job, if you only have one source of income, you're dependent on that just like you are dependent on a job. It may not be as bad if you're working for yourself, but if you only have one thing that you're doing that brings in money, then that could leave just as easily or be disrupted just as easily as a single job. So that's what I'm working on. I I do have multiple sources of income, but most are a lot or a few of them are a lot bigger. So I'd want to develop multiple significant streams of income and uh you know not just related to like selling things online or just related to online revenue because those are two of my biggest um income sources right now and i'd like to get a few more i'd rather i'd even rather have a bunch of small sources than one or two big ones just because that gives you more freedom and more resiliency and then the long-term goal is passive income with a base of real assets a base wealth of real assets so once i've got my six months of stuff squared away including expenses and either gold and silver and things like that, creating passive income to where not only am I not part of the job paradigm, I'm not even part of the working everyday paradigm. And something like a dividend portfolio is very good for that. Or you can have like um, uh, rental properties. Obviously, you're always going to be putting in a little bit of work, whether that's calling up rental people to get their checks or even dealing with a property management company if you do that, or researching your dividend stocks to make sure that you don't need to sell out of one. But that, that's what I recommend for people that are looking to get to a position of financial freedom is develop diverse sources of income, diversify your storage of wealth and with an emphasis on income creation and not just on appreciating assets because that way you make money no matter what. And uh, just to go stick on that point for just another second on income creation, it makes a big difference because say you have gold or silver and over 10 years or whatever, like the the past 10 years, maybe your gold and silver hasn't done well, depending on when you bought it, in terms of creating your money or creating new money for you or making you money. Or if you buy now and then 10 years from now, it's the same dollar amount. You haven't really made any money. And, you know, keeping your purchasing power is significant in and of itself. But like I said, you need money going forward. You know you're going to need money. So at some point, you do have to create new wealth. Somewhere that new wealth has to be coming in. So you want to focus on income creation. And then compare that with if you had a dividend stock that for the past 10 years has been paying you a dividend. Even if at the end of the 10 years that dividend stock is worth less, it doesn't really matter because you've been making money off it the whole time. Same as with the McDonald's example. If you own that McDonald's and you know 25 years later, someone only offers to buy your $20,000 share for $10,000, it wouldn't really matter because you've been making all that, uh, that money every year. You've been getting 20% of the business or whatever. It's probably surpassed that initial um, investment anyway. And just as an example, I know Warren Buffett, he uh, had a, purchased a large share in Coca-Cola way back when, I mean decades ago, and now the annual dividend amount, just what they pay out every year in dividends, is now exceeds the entire initial investment. So I don't know what the number was, but say he paid like $50 million for all his shares back in the day. Now he's getting $50 million every year. And I, like I said, I have no idea what the actual numbers are, but just as an example, the amount he's getting every year just to be a part owner of this successful business is more than he paid into one time to get that. So obviously that would be better than buying something that's $50 million and then a couple years later, wow, I sold for $100 million. That's still a success, but obviously income creation is way more powerful than, um, than just appreciation or speculation, what I call just hoping, speculating that someone will pay more. Because take the other example, say that things haven't gone well, like the thing didn't do really well, you still would be making some money. If you choose your businesses wisely, you're going to be making some money for all those years. Whereas if you buy something just hoping that someone's going to pay more for it later, you may lose money drastically. You could lose all of it. If you buy a piece of artwork or something, hoping that someone's going to pay more for it later, or a piece of property that's not really generating any income, but you just assume someone's going to pay more for it later, you could lose all of it. Or you just wasted a bunch of time and effort when you could have had something that's bringing in actual income. So I always recommend income over um, just speculation or just appreciation. So if you're going to buy real estate, don't just buy a property that you think someone is going to pay more for later. Buy one that you can rent out or buy one that you can have trees on. And every 10 years, you clear cut and sell the lumber or rent out for farmland or somehow have income coming in. If you're going to buy a share in a business, don't just buy a random stock hoping someone's going to pay you more. Buy one that actually gives you a share of the business income, things like that. So while there is a place for speculation in certain areas, especially when you're trying to be massively diversified, 
you definitely want to focus specifically on income and realize the opportunity costs any time that you're speculating. Realize what you could be getting with that. And um, you definitely need to diversify a little bit, so there should be a little bit of um, speculation in there that's not um, not arbitrary. It should be based on you having a really, really good reason to, to think why something may be worth more in the future. But you also want to have a core income uh, portfolio of every different kind of you know asset that you can think of. So that's my basic idea on financial preparedness. Just like every other type of preparedness, to uh, summarize, you want to be able to do without systems of support. Most people's current financial system of support is a job, so you want to be able to pay your bills and uh, get the assets you need without having that current source of income. And the great thing is the way the uh, economy, is, well, not economy really, but the way the financial system is set up is that you can put yourself in a position where you never have to worry about that again if you make good decisions for uh, a significant portion of your life. You can get to where you never have to work again. So that's my goal, certainly. Hopefully that's a goal for all you guys out there as well. Let me know what you think and what you guys are planning on doing for overall financial preparedness, not just doomsday-type financial preparedness. And I will talk to you guys later.